Hello, I'm uh, Christopher Coker. I'm director of LSE Ideas, which is the think tank of the London School, foreign policy think tank of the London School of Economics. I'd like to welcome you to the third in a series of lectures that we've been holding on strategic thinking. Our first was on US national security thinking for the 21st century, the second on ways that uh, non-great powers in East Asia are tackling the rise of China. And the reason for this series is that we concluded some time ago that there has been an absence uh, of strategic thinking in much of the world, certainly in the West. And to quote a former British ambassador to Washington, uh, Peter Ricketts, political leaders need to free themselves from the tyranny of the immediate. And he adds they need to revive the art of strategy. Now, one country which we in the West believe has never ceased to think strategically is Russia. Uh, one of the world's great powers, but no longer, of course, the superpower it once was, facing what the Russian government believes is a hostile West and a series of strategic challenges on its borders, uh, such as the Transcaucasus. And we're fortunate to have today uh, Dmitry Suslov, Deputy Director of the Center for Comprehensive and International Studies at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, a prolific commentator, and a leading authority on Russia's position in the world and its relations uh, with uh, uh, the other great powers. Now, in this series, uh, we ask our, our speakers to talk for about 35 minutes. And then somewhat unusually, I spend 20 minutes interrogating them before opening it up to general discussion. So please post up your questions in the Q&A box. For Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is hash LSE new voices. And this uh, online event is being recorded and hopefully will be available as a podcast. But that's uh, enough from me. So if I may turn to you, Dimitri. Um, thank you very much, uh, Christopher. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to speak at the uh, LSE event uh, on Russian foreign policy strategy. I would, of course, prefer uh, to be in London in person. Uh, uh, the, the last time when I was there was before the pandemic, so I really miss uh, uh, UK, but uh, on the other hand, online uh, uh, participation perhaps even, uh, even allows to make the audience wider. So anyway, uh, uh, with uh, great pleasure, let me uh, share my thoughts with you uh, about Russian foreign policy strategy or Russian national strategy or Russian grand strategy uh, in what Russia considers to be a multipolar world. Uh, and I want to start with some definitions um, uh, uh, as we are in a university event. Uh, what is a grand, uh, a grand strategy? And basically I take some of uh, the definitions which I consider uh, very appropriate from the uh, uh, quite recent excellent report by Rand Corporation, which is called Russian Grand Strategy. Right? And here I list three of the definitions of grand strategy as they uh, provide also based on some scholars. Right? Uh, a, a grand strategy is a country's most important and enduring interests and a theory of how it will use its resources to defend or advance those interests given domestic and international constraints. Grand strategy is the underlying logic which explains how a state's policies will advance its interests. And grand strategy is a way of thinking about how to achieve the state's goals in an uncertain and dynamic international environment. And these three definitions, they basically make it clear for us what we should focus on uh, while talking about Russian foreign policy strategy. First, we should talk about Russian major interests and goals and Russian foreign policy logic. Uh, secondly, uh, we should talk about Russian perception of the prevailing international trends and Russian internal constraints. And thirdly, we will talk about how Russia tries to advance uh, the goals um, uh, and priorities, which I will explain in this evolving international environment as it is uh, viewed uh, from Moscow. So uh, the major interests and goals of, of Russia, they are basically three, security, economic development, uh, and status and role of independent global great power. I fully agree with Christopher. Russia positions itself not as a superpower in the uh, existing and emerging and evolving international order, but as a great power, uh, uh, as, as a great power. 
And these three major goals and priorities, of course, they are partly contradictory to each other. Promotion of the Russian role of independent great power might undermine or challenge Russian economic development. Uh, and the balance between those uh, three major goals shifts uh, from time to time, but none of them can be fully ignored or sacrificed in favor of the other. And all the three are always present at every moment, at every period uh, of Russian foreign policy. And now let me explain more uh, in a more detailed way what is understood or how does Russia understand uh, security, the foreign policy aspects of economic development and this uh, uh, status and role of uh, independent global great power. Russia understands security in the following, uh, in the following way. Uh, first, uh, uh, that Russia preserves its nuclear superpower status, that Russia remains a nuclear superpower. Nuclear, nuclear weapons area is the only area where Russia is and will continue to be the superpower, uh, being equal only to the United States. Russia also considers maintenance of mutual assured destruction with the United States as absolutely vital for its security and uh, uh, maintaining and strengthening flexible, conventional and nuclear deterrent vis-a-vis -vis NATO. By nuclear deterrent vis-a-vis -vis NATO, I of course mean tactical nuclear weapons, which Russia uses to compensate its military inferiority vis-a-vis uh, -vis NATO in conventional arms. Uh, secondly, security, Russian understanding of security requires preservation of buffer zones uh, between Russia and NATO, which are becoming less and less. Uh, and in the Baltic Sea region, those buffer zones no longer exist, right? which of course makes Russia quite vulnerable. Uh, thirdly, security requires Russian full-fledged participation in creation and management of security orders in surrounding regions, including Europe. Russia cannot feel itself secure unless it participates in a full-fledged way in decision-making over European security order, of course, maintaining veto power, because veto provides one with the real uh, uh, participation, uh, uh, with a real decision-making role. And fourthly, uh, security is viewed as uh, maintenance of Russian military dominance in the adjacent regions of, uh, of uh, high importance for Russia, the Arctic, where Russia does have the uh, uh, military dominance, Baltic Sea region, Black Sea region, and the former USSR in general are the regions where Russia is committed, absolutely committed to maintaining its military dominance, right? And uh, according to all the uh, military planners, for instance, if the conflict between Russia and NATO erupts, at the initial stages, Russia will prevail in the Baltic Sea region and in the Black Sea region. What, uh, what does this description of the Russian understanding of security allows us to, uh, to say, or what kind of conclusion can we make? Right? One of the conclusions is that Russia will always feel itself insecure and dissatisfied in a NATO-centric and US-dominated security order in Europe, because US-dominated security order in Europe by default excludes Russia. Unless Russia joins a NATO-centric security order, which seems to be absolutely impossible in the observable future, Russia will feel itself insecure, dissatisfied, and will continue to struggle against this NATO-centric US-led uh, security order in Europe and will try to uh, undermine it. Especially, of course, Russia will resist uh, further NATO enlargement to the uh, former USSR into the Black Sea region, uh, Ukraine and Georgia. The foreign policy aspects of economic development, right? What, how does foreign policy play into this uh, uh, impact Russian economic development? Well, the current level of confrontation between Russia and the West, the current level of anti-Russian sanctions imposed by the West are not viewed as lethal for Russian economy. They are considered more or less affordable and there are even some positive effects uh, of those uh, sanctions, uh, pr primarily the Russian counter sanctions to the Western sanctions, which resulted in a very robust development of the Russian agricultural uh, sector and in conditions of this uh, of the external shock of sanctions, 
uh, Russian economy, Russian financial system has become more sustainable and durable in general. Uh, however, a qualitative increase uh, of anti-Russian sanctions, such as Russian expel, uh, expel of Russia from SWIFT, blocking sanctions uh, against the Russian energy companies and uh, sort of, would be really detrimental for Russian economy and Russia would want to avoid that, right? Uh, 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 thus, we can make a conclusion that Russia would most likely refrain from actions which could result in such uh, uh, sanctions, uh, uh, much more robust uh, sanctions, right? For instance, Russia is most likely to avoid the full-fledged invasion of Ukraine because full-fledged invasion of Ukraine would most likely result in this uh, more robust uh, anti-Russian sanctions. And thirdly, uh, Russia tries to stimulate its economic development mainly by strengthening relations with the non-Western countries. Uh, and I will dwell upon that in greater detail uh, in the concluding part of my lecture. Russia considers relations with China, India, South Korea, Middle East, Africa as very important uh, uh, stimulus for Russian internal economic uh, uh, economic development. The third uh, crucial component of this major interests and goals of Russia is the status and role of independent global great power, which is really considered as sort of Russian historical destiny, national DNA. Uh, and so far, Russia cannot imagine any other place and role for itself in the international order. And this is not just the thinking of Vladimir Putin, but there is a consensus, a general consensus in the Russian foreign policy elite and even in the Russian society that Russia must be a great power. If, there, if Russia is not a great power, there is no Russia. Uh, what does it mean in practical terms, uh, 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 Russian uh, role and status as independent global great power? First, it means that Russia conducts fully independent domestic and foreign policies and resists any interference into domestic affairs. And indeed, and indeed, it is very vital for Russia to resist the foreign interference into domestic affairs. And it is absolutely vital for Russia to conduct fundamentally independent foreign policy, not to coordinate, not to subordinate uh, its foreign policy with anyone, be it the West or China. And the Middle East and Africa are the regions where Russian foreign policy independence is maximum. Secondly, uh, being great power means uh, absolutely means being uh, being absolutely self reliant in defense, and Russia is self reliant in defense. Russia does not need any alliances to defend itself. Uh, and uh, participates only in Russia centric or Russia led military alliances. All the military alliances in which Russia participate are Russian dominated, such as the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And this is precisely the reason why a Russia-China military alliance is very unlikely, because this is the military alliance in which Russia will not be the dominant player. Thirdly, being great power means uh, maintaining Russia-centric economic and security orders in the neighborhood, in the post-Soviet space. And the major manifestations of this Russia centrism in the region are Eurasian Economic Union and the Collective Security Treaty Organizations. And Russia considers respect of these Russia centric orders by the others, by the third players, as a determinant of Russia's relations with these third players. So, with those third players uh, who respect these institutions, Russia led institutions, Russia has good relations. Example is China. Uh, those uh, third players who do not respect try to undermine these Russia-centric institutions, meaning the West, we have bad relations, very easy. Uh, fourthly, uh, uh, being great power means for Russia preventing post-Soviet countries from joining other economic and security orders. And this is kind of another uh, side of the Russia centers, right? Preventing them from joining the other economic and security orders. Look, Russia is pretty much okay when some post-Soviet countries do not participate in uh, Eurasian Economic Union and CSTO. And Russia has quite friendly relations with Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan who are not members of these institutions. But if post-Soviet countries conduct NATO-centric and EU-centric foreign policies, as Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova do, 
of course, they get punishment, right? And the uh, uh, and the relations with Russia uh, becomes confrontational. Fifth. Uh, being great power means that Russia must be globally present, not just regionally prevailing, but globally present, and make sure that it matters not just in its immediate neighborhood, but also in the overseas places, such as the Middle East, Africa. From this perspective, Russian military operation in Syria uh, is of crucial importance, plus Russia wants to establish military bases in Sudan, you know, uh, and so on. Six, uh, 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 Russia takes or, or tries to take active and permanent part in global decision making, right, uh, uh, on par with other uh, centers of power, especially on issues of sovereignty and use of force. And from the Russian perspective, unilateral decisions on these issues, despite Russian objections uh, and Russian uh, position, uh, from the Russian perspective, these are violations of Russian great power status. This is why Russia was so much angry with NATO aggression against Yugoslavia or U US invasion of Iraq, right? Or ultimate uh, destruction of Libya, right? Not just because Russia had certain vested interests in these particular countries, but such behavior simply uh, violates Russian great power role and status because from the Russian perspective, great powers, especially permanent members of the UN Security Council, must be consulted on every single issue of use of force, sovereignty, and territorial integrity in the world. Right. Uh, so uh, NATO aggression against Yugoslavia was a political assault against Russian great power status, as well as the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And thus it uh, it uh, was so much aggravate, uh, 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 so, so much painful for us. Uh, being great power means pursuit of principles of diplomatic equality and reciprocity with the other centers of power, uh, both Western and non-Western. And look, reciprocity is one of the major principles uh, which Russia uses in the relations with, uh, with the others, right? Witness the diplomatic war uh, between Russia and the United States, the expel of diplomats, closing down of consulates, and so on and so forth. Reciprocity, right? Uh, uh, being great power means creating and managing international orders, regional and global international orders on par and with the other centers of power. And from the Russian perspective, international orders should be jointly elaborated, not imposed by either the West or China or jointly elaborated. This is why, of course, universalization or enlargement of the Western international order after the end of the Cold War was never supported by Russia. And finally, being great power for Russia means refusal to join anyone else's orbit be it the West or China, but ideally promote simultaneous partnerships with Europe and Asia, with the West and non-West. Of course, today this is not possible due to Russian confrontation with the West. And in, you know, one of the major principles of Russian foreign policy and one of the elements of constant, uh, one of the constant principles of Russian foreign policy is that Russia refuses to be dominated by anyone else. Russia refuses to accept anyone else's hegemony or leadership, be it the United States or China. This is really a uh, Russian international identity or Russian, or Russian national DNA, which does not depend even on Russian economic conjunction. Even at the time of Russia's major weakness in 1990s, Russia still tried to behave uh, as a great power when Yevgeny Primakov was the Russian uh, foreign minister and later uh, prime minister. And this is, for instance, one of the most fundamental reasons behind Russia's constant hostility towards NATO and behind the failure for Russia to establish partnership with the United States after the end of the Cold War. Because simply accepting American hegemony is completely unacceptable. It is against this Russian uh, national DNA. And whereas on the other hand, the major guarantee of partnership, positive partnership between Russia and China is precisely that China refuses to conduct a hegemonic policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and maintains diplomatic equality with Russia despite the growing asymmetry to the favor of China. Of course, Russia-China relations are increasingly asymmetric. But what matters is not asymmetry per se. What matters is management of asymmetry. Because China does not translate this asymmetry into hegemonic policies vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And this is the foundation of good relations 
uh, between Moscow and Beijing. And from the Russian perspective, China will continue to respect Russia as a great power, to maintain this equal partnership in a symmetric context, as long as China faces confrontation from the United States. Whereas in the longer term, uh, of course, the China challenge will become quite probable and Russian ability to remain global independent great power will become more questionable, right? Uh, uh, so um, the, 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 the prospects of the end of US-China confrontation is quite challenging for Russia and one of the major challenges uh, to Russian ability to maintain its uh, great power status. What, what comes next after US-China uh, confrontation? Now some words about domestic constraints and limitations uh, uh, for Russia. Uh, of course, economy, demography, and the state of society, or, or the prevailing mood uh, in the Russian society are the major internal constraints. As economy is concerned, uh, the major constraint is uh, sluggish and, uh, and stagnating Russian economic development. Uh, it's slow diversification rather than the size, because usually the, the size of the Russian economy is identified as its major weakness. This is not the case. I mean, I, I, I do not agree with that. You know, according to the uh, uh, power purchasing parity uh, uh, calculation of GDP, Russia is at the sixth place in the world, which is quite okay. Uh, and quite soon, Russia is expected to move at the fifth, uh, to the fifth place of, uh, in the world and become the major economy in Europe and will surpass German, right? Already now, Russia surpasses UK, France, I mean, and all the other European countries except Germany in terms of the size of its economy. But the structure of economy, slow growth of economy, this is indeed the problem. And unless Russia manages to resolve this problem, of course, Russian chances to maintain its great power role in the longer term prospect will be difficult. Demography is a real challenge because, uh, I mean, Russian uh, 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 Russia is a country of 142 million people, and this number is shrinking. This number is shrinking. And again, unless Russia is able to manage this a uh, problem of depopulation, it will be difficult for Russia to maintain its role in the longer term prospect. Uh, and the, uh, this, uh, the mood in the society, Russian society is quite inward looking. Russian society does not support greater foreign policy costs, large scale expansionism or major increase uh, of the Russian defense spending, which is by the way, reducing. Right. For instance, in 2016, uh, Russian, the share of Russian defense spending was 5.4% uh, of the Russian GDP. Today, it is 4% of, uh, of the Russian GDP. And Russia, uh, even Putin, uh, boasts to the Russian society uh, that Russia is the only nuclear and P5 country, which is now reducing its uh, defense spending, because this reduction of defense spending is supported by the society. Right, uh, so uh, it means that Russian foreign policy to be supportive by the society, Russian foreign policy has to be relatively cheap. It has to avoid additional major costs which could jeopardize the level of welfare, such as again, uh, Russia being cut from SWIFT and so on and so forth. Whereas the current Russian foreign policy, including the Russian engagement with Ukraine and with Syria is viewed and really is relatively low cost. And uh, this low cost uh, state of the Russian foreign policy is among important reasons for the support uh, of Russian foreign policy by the society. Now, external environment, right? How does Russia see the world? Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the major elements, the major pillars of Russian perception of the external world is that the world has become uh, post-West and bifurcated. And as I said above in the very beginning, analysis of external environment is absolutely vital to understand Russian foreign policy strategy, uh, because this analysis determines what exactly Russia should do to maintain itself as a great power, to strengthen its security, and to stimulate its economic development in this global setting. And in general, in general, global trends are viewed by Russia uh, and in Russia as generally favorable increasing Russian influence and allowing Russia to play the, a greater role in world affairs than the Russian material resources allow. So it is fair to say that global trends 
existing global trends kind of compensate for Russian internal weaknesses. One of the major assets that Russia has in the world is the global trends, right? Uh, and uh, as I said, the global context is seen as post-West uh, and bifurcated. What do I mean by post-West uh, international setting, right? It means that since the end of 2000s, Russia no longer views the world as West-centric, let alone uh, West-dominated. And Russia no longer regards the West, including Europe, as a synonym to modernity, right? The crucial turning point was, of course, the uh, economic crisis of 2008. Indeed, right, from the Russian perspective, uh, and not just from the Russian perspective, the, the, the manifestations of a post-West uh, state of the world are that the United States is unable to determine the course of world history, right? The end of history turned out to be a mirage, right? Uh, uh, global universalization of the US-led international order failed and so on. Uh, uh, U.S. is unable to uh, uh, determine development of key regions, such as Asia and the Middle East. Uh, from the Middle East, the U.S. even partially withdraws. The Pacific, not the Atlantic, has become the centerpiece of world economy and world politics. Two major power centers of, of the world are and will be the United States and China. This is already the end uh, to the West centricism, China has already become and will increasingly be the second superpower. And the outcome of the US-China com uh, competition is absolutely unclear, right? Uh, but at the same time, this uh, uh, the, the, the domi or the, the prevalence of the US and China over all the rest does not mean a new bipolarity. From the Russian perspective, the world is not becoming bipolar again. Why? Because non-Western countries in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East conduct increasingly independent foreign policies. They try to strengthen their sovereignty and avoid choosing between the United States or China. South Korea, Turkey could be uh, multiple examples of this uh, countries trying to become increasingly independent rather than joining block to block uh, uh, confrontation. And in such a post-West world, Russia simply should not conduct, it is foolish uh, for Russia to conduct a West-centric foreign policy. And in this post-West setting, Russia is less dependent on the West in terms of its economic development and in terms of international influence and uh, status. So relations with the West are no longer the major priority of Russian foreign policy. And unlike 1990s or 2000s when the world was unipolar, Russia today can afford confrontation with the West. Low intensity, but still can afford confrontation with the West. Relations with the non-West in this post-West world became a value of their own for Russia. They are no longer just an instrument in Russian disputes with the West. Uh, they are no longer an exchange card in Russian relations with the West. It is absolutely mistaken, for instance, to consider Russian presence and policy in Syria as an exchange card for Ukraine that Russia would kind of, you know, exchange Syria for Ukraine. This is just wrong, right? Because uh, Russian relations with the non-Western countries are determined by, the, by these very relations, by the benefits that Russia can get from, uh, from relations with these particular non-West uh, countries. So uh, this is why uh, Russia uh, proclaimed many foreign policy initiatives towards the Northwest, such as turn to the East, return to Africa, intensification of Russian presence and influence in the Middle East, and so on. In this post-West world, Russia positions itself as a non-Western player and refuses uh, uh, you know, to return to the Western orbit. A good manifestation was Russian rejection of the proposal to return to the G8 when it was uh, uh, discussed by Macron and uh, Donald Trump, right? Uh, and Russia made it very clear that we have BRICS. We don't need uh, a, a revival of G8, of G8 because you know, we have another community, right? We have another grouping. BRICS is the natural arrangement in which Russia uh, participates. Russia intensifies economic relations with the non-West uh, countries, right? Uh, just witness the reduction of the share of European Union in Russian foreign policy trade and the increase uh, of the share of China, 
uh, in in Russian foreign policy trade. Uh, 4% it was 1999. In 1999, China had, was 4% of the Russian trade to Nova. Today it is 18%, right? 51% uh, uh, was 2013. Uh, European Union had 51% uh, uh, of the Russian uh, foreign trade turnover before Ukraine crisis. Now it is about 33%. So just feel the, uh, feel the difference. And non-Western countries, India, China, Middle East, African countries, are already now the major markets for Russian non-energy, not non-raw materials exports. And the major items of Russian non-raw materials exports are arms and agriculture. So China, India, Middle East, and Africa are the major markets for Russian arms uh, and uh, agricultural products. For instance, one third of Russian agricultural exports go to Africa. Now, bifurcated element of the Russian perception of the world. Uh, why bifurcated? Because it combines both positive and negative features. And I will start with the positive features. Well, uh, the major positive feature of the, of the world from the Russian perspective is that the Western hegemony, as well as universalization of the Western values and developmental models are over. The world has really become polycentric and ideologically diverse. Thus, Russia has been historically correct since 1990s, right? Because since 1990s, Russia started to argue in favor of multipolarity, and the world has become multipolar. So, who is at the right side of history? The US and China, uh, and this is the second major positive element uh, of the global setting from the Russian perspective, these two major superpowers. They are locked in long-term and ir irreversible confrontation. And the foreign policy by Joe Biden proved that US-China confrontation is irreversible. And this is very positive for Russia because this US-China confrontation increases the value of Russia for both China and the United States, as well as for those regional powers who don't want to choose uh, between the US and, uh, and China. Russia is a, is a natural partner for them. Uh, the interest of Biden administration to stabilize confrontation with Russia, which we witness nowadays, uh, is to a big extent because of China. So the U.S.-Russian relations have already, we can say, slightly improved because of the U.S.-China confrontation. China cannot afford hegemonic approach vis-a-vis -vis Russia as long as the United States regards China as the major adversary and confronts it. So we, we, uh, we have safe uh, uh, front with China as long as there is confrontation uh, between China and the United States. So the US-China confrontation objectively strengthens Russian security. It objectively strengthens Russian security in terms of Russia-China relations, in terms of the US-Russian relations, and it strengthens Russian global influence. Russia is, of course, interested in low intensity confrontation between the US and China as long as possible. You know, high intensity confrontation will probably compel Russia to make choice which Russia would want to, uh, to avoid. But low intensity confrontation is absolutely kind of very favorable setting uh, for, uh, for Russia. Whereas, whereas the world after US-China confrontation is considered to be much less favorable for Russia, no matter how it ends, right? Uh, either US win or China win, or basically there is some US-China condominium, uh, this will make the world much less favorable uh, for Russia because the winner of this new condominium would, would uh, uh, conduct hegemonic policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis Russia and nothing will prevent this winner to conduct hegemonic policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So, I mean, Russia really tries or really prefers US-China confrontation to continue you know, for decades to come, this is the, uh, uh, the, the this is very positive uh, positive environment for Russia. Next uh, positive elements: the non-Western players conduct increasingly independent foreign policies. As I said, refuse to join the U.S. or, or China in a block-to-block -block approach, and they do recognize Russia as legitimate independent great power and equal co-author of international orders. So Russia has generally positive relations with the overwhelming majority of non-Western countries in all the non-Western regions in the world. There is no single enemy of Russia in the non-Western world. The only player with whom Russia has confrontation is the West, which, as I said above, is no longer considered dominant 
and whose relative power in the world is considered to be declining. Moreover, from the Russian perspective, we, we feel the growing demand on Russia and welcoming of Russia, of engagement of Russia in many non-Western regions, be it Africa, Asia, or the, uh, or the Middle uh, East. Why? Because Russia is viewed there as a sovereignty enabler, which can help those countries to strengthen sovereignty and independence. But unlike the US and China, Russia cannot become a hegemon for those non-Western players. And this increases their favorable attitude uh, towards Russia and uh, uh, strengthens their outreach uh, to Russia. So you see, uh, being not a superpower is actually an advantage for Russia in the existing setting rather than a, a, a weakness. The major negative, uh, uh, the, 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 there are also important negative elements uh, of the state of the world. Uh, from the Russian perspective. The first is, of course, that the West refuses to recognize Russia as legitimate, independent, global great power. The West refuses to accept the rules and principles which I listed above in the beginning of this lecture, and thus we have confrontational relations with the West. Uh, the second challenge uh, uh, which Russia faces is that the rise of China as the second superpower and China and the US being the top players in the world moves Russia to the position of a second tier country which is psychologically uneasy, but still, it, as I just said, it is manageable and even opens some uh, new opportunities uh, uh, in terms of Russia's relations with the non-Western countries in Asia, Middle East, uh, and Africa. Again, what is more serious kind of challenge is China's policy towards Russia after its confrontation with the United States. This is where, where the real danger lies uh, for Russia in the uh, global environment. As for the uh, Russia West, uh, the US Russia confrontation, this confrontation will last at least until the end of 2020s. Neither Russia nor the United States are ready to end this confrontation through concessions, and the United States, because of its domestic restraints, even cannot afford uh, uh, to do some concessions vis a vis Russia. Uh, so, in the near term future, the best scenario for US Russian relations is. Fragile stabilization, not overcoming, but fragile stabilization of confrontation. And even such model of managed confrontation is indeed very fragile and can turn into new escalation anytime, as we now witness in the Black Sea region. However, and this is very crucial element of this Russian strategic calculus, in the longer term prospect, from the Russian perspective, the US is expected to seek reconciliation with Russia and to eventually accept Russia as Russia wants to be accepted. Why? For two reasons. First, American inability to contain Russia and China simultaneously. Already now, the United States avoids simultaneous increase of confrontation with Russia and China, right? And the US wants kind of safe front uh, with Russia, st stable front with Russia, while it wants to allocate major resources and attention to containing uh, of, uh, of uh, China. And from the Russian perspective, further changes will come from the uh, United States, positive for Russia, right? The US will need not just stable confrontation with Russia, but less confrontation with Russia as it uh, uh, struggles with China. And secondly, uh, uh, U US foreign policy is already changing in a broader way, right? The US has already rejected the policy of global spread of democracy, of the global spread of the US-led international order. Uh, uh, both Trump and Biden administration rejected this uh, policy of US acting as a global sheriff. So look, American foreign policy is shifting, right? And this shift, the, the, these changes, which are seen as very positive by Russia, they will, uh, uh, they will continue. Thus, the, uh, the outcome right, of this analysis is the, uh, or the conclusion of this analysis is Russian strategic patience, uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis the United States, which, me which means managing confrontation with the United States in the time, uh, in the near term prospect, avoiding its uncontrollable escalation, avoiding inadvertent war or full fledged uh, arms race withstanding the confrontation economically and politically and waiting, basically waiting for this further adaptation of American foreign policy, uh, uh, which Russia expects, 
right, and which uh, is supposed to result in improvement of relations with Russia on the Russian terms, on the Russian terms. So, I mean, Russian strategy vis-a-vis -vis the United States is not a strategy of capitulation. Russia is fully convinced that it can prevail. It can uh, 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 compel the United States to accept the rules of the game, the principles which I listed, uh, uh, which I listed above, precisely because of the global setting, right? Precisely because of the U.S.-China confrontation, in particular. And a similar conclusion is made for Europe. Of course, on the one hand, so far, uh, European Union uh, refuses to accept Russia and Eurasian Economic Union as legitimate players. European Union even refuses to recognize Eurasian Economic Union. Poland and the Baltic states prevent any positive steps of the EU vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, and Europe and European Union will remain hugely dependent on the United States economically in terms of security, right? And uh, the EU is unlikely to become autonomous hard security player uh, in the longer term prospect. But on the one hand, all the major problems of transatlantic relations remain. Europeans are already disappointed with Biden, right, whose rhetoric differs from Trump's, but not necessarily real policies. Trumpism in the United States is not dead. Unilateralism remains a very strong tradition of the US foreign policy. So from the Russian perspective, new crises of transatlantic relations are simply inevitable. Uh, the European Union is becoming increasingly irrelevant in the world of two rival superpowers. Right, we end with the US prioritizing the Pacific over the Atlantic and in the world of increased role of military force. Thus, from the Russian perspective, Europeans are also expected to become more favorable and flexible uh, towards Russia in the longer term prospect. And this results, uh, this analysis and these predictions uh, uh, result in three major pillars of Russian foreign policy. These three major pillars are maintaining Russia's centrism in the post-Soviet space, managing confrontation with the US, NATO, and the EU, and strengthening partnerships with Asian, Eurasian, Middle Eastern, and even, if possible, uh, some European countries. As for Russia's centrism in the post-Soviet space, look, Russia can no longer dominate the post-Soviet space. Russia because there are already multiple external players, not just the West, but China, Turkey have deeply involved into the post-Soviet affairs. Uh, in many ways, post-Soviet countries refuse to support Russia and conduct very different policies from Russia. You know, they do not recognize Crimea as part of Russia. Uh, their relations with the West, you know, uh, remain partnership, not confrontation. They do not join uh, anti-sanctions uh, and so on and so forth. Russia refuses to spread its political model in the post-Soviet space and doesn't interfere into domestic affairs of post-Soviet countries unless these domestic affairs risk changing foreign policy orientation uh, of post-Soviet countries, right? Thus, uh, it is absolutely acceptable for Russia, for instance, that among the uh, post-Soviet allies, we have democratic Armenia and, uh, and almost democratic Kyrgyzstan, much more pluralist uh, Kyrgyzstan. Armenia is a democracy, right? Kyrgyzstan is almost a democracy, together with more authoritarian Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan, right? And uh, Russia, as I said already above, does not demand participation of all the post-Soviet countries in all Russia-centric uh, institutions. Relations with Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan, which are not members of the Eurasian Economic Union and CSTO, are absolutely friendly. Right, and it's okay for us. So instead of domination, I would say Russia offers three major rules or principles or red lines to the post-Soviet countries, respect of which guarantee partnership with Russia, friendliness of Russia, security, territorial integrity, and economic development of those countries. First, post-Soviet countries must or should avoid staying of, uh, should, uh, should stay out of uh, security and economic orders of the others. In particular, they should stay out of NATO and European Union. Secondly, they should avoid becoming instruments of anti-Russian policies by the others, right? They must not become tools of containment of Russia by the others, like by NATO and the United States. And thirdly, they should avoid building their identities on anti-Russian basis. Those countries in the region who accept those rules are absolutely okay. Those countries who don't accept these rules well, they, uh, they are punished, 
right? And Russia will continue to undermine them with uh, economic and military tools. The end game towards Ukraine and Georgia, which proclaim NATO and European Union as their foreign policy goals, is basically that they should reject NATO aspirations, improve relations with Russia, become common neighborhood between the European Union and Russia and Eurasian Economic Union, not just a neighborhood of the EU and NATO. Is it feasible? The answer is yes, from the Russian perspective. Yes, it is feasible and possible in the longer term prospect, but requires a change of the US and EU policies. From the Russian perspective, uh, as soon as NATO proclaims closed door policy instead of open door policy, as soon as the United States tells those countries that they must improve their relations with Russia, this change will happen. They will do that, right? Because Russia is really convinced that the current foreign policy orientations of Ukraine and Georgia are the results of Western preferences and policies. So when the Western preferences and policies change, those countries will change as well. And such change of the Western policy is considered likely in the longer term prospect. Right, because we, uh, we already uh, uh, discussed it. Managing confrontation with the United States and NATO uh, includes strengthening nuclear and non-nuclear deterrence and mutual assured destruction, right? Thus, uh, uh, the development and deployment of hypersonic missiles by Russia and so on. It requires dialogue and dialogue with the United States is going on. It requires cooperation with the United States on deconfliction, avoiding military uh, 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 direct military clash and full-fledged arms race by meal-to-meal -meal dialogue on deconfliction, which goes on with the US, dialogue on strategic stability, which goes on with the US, and dialogue on cybersecurity, which goes on with the US. Also, Russia prefers to have uh, selective cooperation on areas of mutual interest with the United States, such as climate change, Arctic, and non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Well, some of them go, some of them not. And a crucial element of Russian policy vis-a-vis -vis the uh, US uh, is flexible policy, Russian flexible policy towards US allies and partners. Russia wants many allies and partners to become Russian partners, right? Uh, especially in the non-Western world. Countries like Japan, South Korea, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt are all allies of the United States, treaty allies of the United States, but they do not want to sacrifice their relations with Russia and accept Japan, none of them imposed anti-Russian sanctions and Japanese sanctions were very symbolic. All of them diversify their foreign and security policies and none of them support further escalation of the US-Russian uh, confrontation. So from the Russian perspective, if the United States realizes that it becomes isolated itself, you know, US is very fond of talking about Russian isolation, but if the United States feels that it is isolated in its confrontational policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, it would be easier for the United States to, uh, to adopt, uh, uh, to adapt. And in the longer term prospect, of course, Russia is interested in improving relations with the West European countries, but in the short term prospect, it is highly difficult and the EU-Russia relations will continue to deteriorate. And finally, uh, policy towards the non-West. First includes strengthening strategic partnership with China, but without formal alliance, right? Uh, China will remain Russia's major strategic partner outside of the former USSR for the long term prospect. Good relations with China are considered as absolutely vital for Russian security, economic development, and great power status. But at the same time, Russia combines strengthening partnership with China with intensification of partnerships with other Asian players, India, South Korea, ASEAN, and even Japan. Equal partnership, respective attitude from Beijing is likely as long as it faces confrontation from the United States. Whereas beyond confrontation with the United States, well, the community of Greater Eurasia uh, is perceived as a way to avoid or at least mitigate the probable hegemonic attitudes from China vis-a-vis -vis Russia after its confrontation with the United States. Secondly, Russia tries to strengthen balanced partnerships, uh, uh, networks of partnerships in Asia and the Middle East, right? In Asia, I already said, in the Middle East, Russia is already the only global player which keeps balanced partnerships with all the major Middle Eastern great powers. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, and Israel are all partners of Russia, right? And uh, last but not least, in particular, 
uh, strengthening, not just keeping balanced relations, but strengthening Russian positions in the Middle East and Africa. Russia wants to strengthen its position as the leader uh, in the resolution of Syrian conflict. Russia wants to strengthen its position as a participant of the resolution of conflict in, in Libya. And one of the latest manifestations of this Russian strategy of strengthening its position as a global independent great power is the uh, declaration of the so-called Russian return to Africa, uh, which, uh, uh, which happened in 2019. And Africa is also viewed as quite an attractive market uh, for Russian goods and services and a friendly political partner. So Russia really tries to uh, increase its uh, presence and influence in Africa and considers it uh, uh, very much uh, possible. So I will stop here. Uh, 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 I apologize if I spoke a little bit longer than originally expected, but uh, I would be very uh, uh, eager to, uh, to have the discussion and to answer the questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. That's a very comprehensive picture. And I think you've set out some very clear strategic goals uh, that Russia has set itself over the last 20 years, uh, making itself, as you said, independent uh, of a perhaps declining United States, a rising China and uh, a European Union, which isn't going very far, very fast in terms of being itself an independent player. And that's important because relations are deteriorating as we speak over the Belarus migration issue and the stakes are getting slightly higher. Or they, anyway, the rhetoric is getting uh, more heated. Can I just ask you then, start off with some general points, uh, two general points. Uh, Russia has this reputation, as I said before in my opening remarks, of being one of the few countries to do strategy in, in, in the sense that was understood by Americans like Zbigniew Brzezinski, for example, who I'd say is one of the last major strategic thinkers in the United States and much respected in Russia. His books were translated into Russian and, and read. Um, but Putin, of course, is not a chess grandmaster. He's a judo player. And the, uh, the emphasis on, on judo is throwing your opponent off balance and seizing opportunities. So in many ways, he's seen as a tactician uh, sometimes more than a strategist, but he's also seen by others as more of a strategist than a tactician. I don't know whether if you want to, you yourself want to draw a distinction between the two. I mean, do we exaggerate uh, Russia's uh, ability to think strategically? Um, the second question I want to ask is about grand strategy, because there was, of course, a grand strategy of the Cold War, deterrence and containment and engagement. But the world is now, as you said, dynamic, and it's become increasingly complex and complicated. And so those rather simple rules of thumb that kept us from a nuclear war during the Cold War are very difficult to apply today. And, and people like Mervyn King and John Kay, they've written a book together. They're economists, of course, called Radical Uncertainty, arguing that you can't do grand strategy in today's world, that you have to be more tactical and very, very flexible in how you respond to opportunities and challenges. So those are just two very uh, broad uh, questions about strategy itself. I don't know whether you wish to address them. Um, thank you very much, Christopher. Excellent questions. Uh, first, I think that Putin is both a strategist and uh, uh, and a, a master of tactic players, but we shouldn't overestimate the personal factor of Putin in determining strategic orientation of Russian foreign policy. You know, you, uh, uh, the, the term Putin's Russia, Putin's foreign policy, I think is a big extent exaggeration uh, because Russian foreign policy is a collective endeavor, is a collective process in which many actors participate, right? Uh, the permanent members of the National Security Council of the Russian Federation actually provides you the list uh, of those key uh, decision makers. Uh, and uh, many uh, important issues are collectively discussed. Uh, there is a foreign policy planning division uh, in the Russian foreign ministry, which tries to think strategically, right, and tries to analyze uh, global trends. Uh, the apparatus of the National Security Council of the Russian Federation does the same, right, and conducts very intensive strategic policy planning. What will China become in 20, 30, 50 years from now? What the US will become? What will Europe become? Even I participate in, you know, uh, in some of those uh, strategic discussions. So, I mean, these, are, these issues are being discussed. They are being addressed very seriously. And they translate into some 
foreign policy decision making. Of course, uh, uh, Putin uh, makes very multiple uh, strategic, uh, sorry, tactical uh, choices. I think uh, the response to the revolution, to the uh, uh, 2014 revolution in Ukraine was tactical. Uh, uh, the decision to uh, intervene into Syria militarily was tactical um, and, and so on. But uh, uh, I, 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 I will give to you uh, a uh, indication of strategic approach. Right again, based on the analysis of the world and uh, preventing uh, prevailing trends. Uh, in early 2000s, Putin was perhaps the most pro-Western uh, politician uh, in the Russian leadership of that time. Putin initiated NATO-Russia Council. Putin, you know, supported the United States in its war in Afghanistan, and he was the only. Uh, uh, top politician in Russia who supported the uh, and welcomed the U.S. Uh, opening military base in Central Asia, something unthinkable uh, by uh, by Russia uh, at that time, you know, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Putin uh, uh, initiated rapprochement with the European Union, right, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and so on. Why? Uh, because uh, the world uh, of early 2000s seemed unipolar. West dominated, West centric. There was no alternative, simply, uh, right at that time. Uh, 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 China was just starting its uh, its rise, let alone technological uh, uh, development and sophistication and modernization. There was no power in the world that would that could counterbalance uh, the the United States and, uh, and and the West at large. There were two poles of power and prosperity: United States and the European Union. That's it. Right? And this predetermined Russian turn towards the West initiated by Putin in early 2000s, right? I would remind to you that, that Russia-Western relations severely deteriorated in the second half of 1990s because of NATO enlargement, NATO war against Yugoslavia. Putin made a change towards the West, right? Because the world seemed unipolar. But this analysis changed uh, in the second half of 2000s. Right, uh, due to the relative decline of the US, due to all the troubles that the United States started to experience in the Middle East, in Iraq and Afghanistan, rise of China, rise of India, rise of Russia itself, the calculus changed. The calculus changed, right? And in the new calculus, uh, Russian foreign policy became fundamentally different, right? So this, uh, I think, is an uh, indicator of strategic element. And, Again, um, uh, Putin is not the only uh, is not the, the only decision maker. There is a prevailing foreign policy consensus in the Russian officialdom, uh, in the Russian foreign policy elite, uh, uh, and it is a collective uh, a collective uh, process rather than you know just uh, individual decisions. Um, second question, excellent question, and uh, there is no consensus uh, in Russia about what to do with that, right? And many prominent uh, Russian foreign policy experts, uh, like Sergei Karaganov, for instance, uh, argue that in the context of this increasing chaos, uh, uh, flexibility, instability, you know, shifting of everything, uh, the best possible uh, strategy for Russia would be kind of uh, shining self-isolation you know, or, or neo-isolation or something, you know, restrain its participation in the, uh, in the outer world. And indeed, the, uh, this opinion, uh, which you described uh, in your question that uh, the world is becoming so flux, uh, so unpredictable that it is simply impossible to conduct uh, any long-term strategy, uh, uh, this opinion is quite, uh, uh, popular uh, in Russia these days. Uh, but uh, as I said, there is no consensus and there are those who disagree uh, with, uh, uh, with this. Uh, we still are able to uh, figure out uh, certain trends that, uh, that prevail, right? Uh, I mean, emergence of the US and China, for instance, as two superpowers, confrontational state of relations between the United States and, uh, and China, these are the things which we can analyze and predict 
uh, in the at least near term uh, 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 prospect, right? And this still allows to uh, conduct policy. And uh, uh, I agree with the second uh, uh, opinion, right? Uh, and I think that it is still possible to uh, to make pr uh, uh, analysis uh, of prevailing global trends. Uh, uh, you know, weakening of traditional alliances uh, and the emergence of flexible coalitions of the willing is <laughs> a, a, a trend, right? Uh, it should not uh, kind of puzzle us, right? It is a trend to which we can adapt. And Russia, by the way, adapts to that trend. You know, the Astana format uh, to manage the Syrian crisis, which brings together Russia, Turkey, and Iran, is precisely the flexible coalition of the willing, ad hoc uh, coalition. So if we uh, think that this is the prevailing trend, then we should use this uh, this trend in our uh, uh, in our policy. So I think yes, it is possible still to strategize. Well, the world is, in, is indeed in flux, but there seem to be certain continuities that distinguish Russian uh, strategic thinking from Western strategic thinking, and the two that traditionally we look at are geography and history. And we've mentioned history a number of times. Russia's historical destiny. Uh, the Russian uh, military's a task of correcting historical mistakes, etc. We don't speak this language of history uh, in this. Uh, China does, but we don't uh, in the Western world any longer. Uh, do you see that uh, as, as, as a weakness? Because, of course, all the traditional threats to Russia have been ideational threats uh, from the West, whether it's Napoleonic republicanism or whether it's uh, fascism or whether it's uh, a wild West capitalism under Yeltsin, or today, of course, it would be the, the liberal world order, the, the values based as opposed to value pluralism, which is very much, I think, a, a Russian and a Chinese uh, idea. The other is geography. And you, uh, I mean, Sergei Lavrov famously said that uh, we're a minority stakeholder in globalization. We put so much emphasis on globalization to actually be our strategic concern. Was, uh, for example, Blair saying at the Chicago speech, we're dealing with the, with the bad side of globalization, the underside of globalization, which for him was ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, for example. Um, you, you said that Russia was in fact pretty invulnerable to sanctions, and, and that might be because it's a minority stakeholder in globalization. Lavrov said that some years ago, of course, mm -hmm. things might be in your mind slightly different now. But all I wanted to, for you to tease out from you is, is whether geography and history are still the main continuities in Russian thinking uh, over the last uh, 200 years. That hasn't really changed. Uh, I think that you are absolutely right. Uh, history and geography first are one of the major determinants of Russian foreign policy identity uh, and of Russian uh, security threat uh, uh, perceptions. Um, uh, Russia uh, clings to the status and role of global great power due to its history, right? Uh, uh, because Russia has been a great power since at least 18th century. Right, because Russia does consider itself uh, a country, by the way, together with UK, uh, which has not been defeated uh, militarily uh, over the last several hundred of years, right? Uh, because Russia was a superpower uh, during the uh, the Cold War, right? And uh, thus, uh, it, from 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 this historical perspective, it is rightful for Russia to play the role of. Uh, of great power, even if material resources uh, that Russia possesses at this or that period of time do not allow that, right? Like in 1990s, right? Uh, and uh, 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 geography matters. Uh, geography matters too. Uh, of course, you know Russia is the biggest uh, country uh, on uh, uh, on Earth geographically. You know, uh, geography uh, creates the Russian sense of insecurity uh, and Russian obsession with securitizing its adjacent regions. You know, I, uh, I mentioned uh, in, uh, uh, in my original presentation that one of the elements of Russia's perception of security, uh, 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 that for Russia to, be, to feel secure, Russia must dominate militarily adjacent regions. Right. Uh, well, uh, China is a big exception, but so far Russia does not feel a threat uh, 
uh, from the uh, from the Chinese perspective. But uh, you know, at uh, at the other dimensions, it is vital for Russia to maintain its uh, military uh, dominance uh, in the uh, in the adjacent regions. History and geography uh, play a big big role in uh, Russian threat perceptions vis-a-vis -vis the West. Right, because the where was the major front of the Cold War? Europe, uh, from where Russia was attacked, invaded militarily uh, uh, every time after the Mongol invasion uh, of the th of the uh, 13th century. Again, Europe, right, uh, and uh, the Western invasions actually threatened the survival of the Russian uh, state, especially in the 20th uh, uh, century. Thus. It developed this Russian obsession of uh, uh, having such a, a European security system, uh, which hypothetically excludes any, uh, which excludes by default any chance of Russia being attacked hypothetically again, right? Thus, buffer zones or Russian full fledged participation and veto power in decision making over the uh, over the European security uh, uh, security affairs. Uh, so yes, uh, geography and history matter. Yes, uh, geography and history are one of the strongest sources of continuity uh, of, uh, uh, of Russian foreign policy. Yes, uh, Russia does not consider the end of the Cold War and globalization as crucial uh, uh, game changes in terms of canceling all the uh, all the previous historic experience, and now we start uh, from the very beginning. But uh, I would say that in the policy of the United States, there is uh, an increasingly visible element of geopolitics uh, and where geography matters. Right, uh, and by the way, where history matters, uh, uh, also in U.S. foreign policy, they just don't maybe publicly say it, but uh, we know uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, the United States has never had a history of equal great power relations, right? Uh, the and uh, the United States have has never. Uh, participated in joint creation of international orders uh, with the others. It moved from isolationism to hegemonism. Uh, when, uh, the United States has always been the strongest player uh, in its uh, region uh, in, uh, in America. And this continues to have consequences on American foreign policy. You know, it predetermines US foreign policy traditions, which are absolutely valid uh, up to uh, up to these days. Uh, and as for geopolitics, look, uh, uh, today there is a revival of the thinking in the United States that it is not in their uh, interests to have even greater rapprochement between Russia and China, consolidation of Eurasia on the anti-American basis, and that the United States is interested, and this is reflected even in the Biden's approach, uh, the United States is interested in stabilizing relations with Russia, while it focuses on uh, uh, containment of China. The third element that you didn't mention, um, although I think you touched upon it indirectly, is, is Russian identity. Um, is Russia a European uh, country or is it a Eurasian uh, country? That's a debate that Russians have uh, between themselves, of course, and it can be both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But I'm thinking, for example, of the problem with Ukraine, when you have the idea that Ukraine is really ours uh, and that the idea of an independent Ukrainian uh, entity is something that is, is difficult for Russians to swallow. In a way, for example, that uh, if, if the United Kingdom dissolves tomorrow, um, Scotland has never been ours. It's never been England any more than England has been Scotland. The, the two countries have maintained completely separate identities, even when they were joined in a political union, which is just over 200 years old. This doesn't seem to be the point. I'm, I'm using the language of Solzhenitsyn, of course, who actually said Ukraine is ours, Kazakhstan is ours, Kazakhstan is not ours. Um, to what extent is there an identity problem in the Ukrainian and the Belarusian uh, questions? Um, because I think that is, is something that needs to be touched upon. And secondly, you didn't use the term civilization. Uh, when we're talking about spheres of influence, of buffer states, I, I remember Medvedev saying we should have a, a privileged zone of civilizational interest. 
that these uh, neighbors of ours are actually part of a common civilization. So one is using a, a language which one associates perhaps with the West, talking about who's Western and who's not Western and what the West actually means as a kind of ideational as well as a political community. So could you just say something about civilizational identity? And it is a question, by the way, I noticed posed by someone from the higher school of economics uh, talking about Yalta too. If we're going to talk about buffer zones and spheres of interest, are we moving towards a second kind of Yalta carve up uh, of, of some part of the world, not the entire world, obviously. Uh, quite a few questions in that, in that one. Please touch upon whichever you think is. The most useful. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, as for Russian identity, this is the never-ending uh, dispute, of course. Russia, what kind of country Ru is Russia and what is uh, Russian identities? There are three uh, basically schools of thoughts, the westernizers, uh, the civilizationists, or Eurasianists, and realists. Um, uh, in terms of, I, and this dispute has been going on since the time of Peter the Great, and I mean, uh, nothing fundamentally changed uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this dispute. Uh, 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 in terms of ide cultural identity, Russia is obviously a European country. Right and Russian cultural uh, identity, civilizational, if you want, identity is Europe. Um, but um, uh, foreign policy identity of Russia is different. Geopolitical identity of Russia is uh, is different. So this is why probably we should uh, 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 consider a multi-layered uh, identity of uh, of uh, uh, of Russia. Um, uh, but uh, the 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 uh, the value of Europe as a significant other for Russia, which has always been since the time of Peter the Great, again, is probably going down uh, with the reduction of European attractiveness uh, to Russia as a pole of development, of technologies, of modernization. Uh, and uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, after all, uh, Peter the Great uh, went to Europe uh, and uh, established uh, Saint Petersburg not because he kind of loved uh, uh, Europe uh, by default and wanted to completely uh, Europeanize Russia, which he didn't, right? He Europeanized the the clothes, you know, and the beard, but not, not the real, you know, power dynamics uh, in, uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, but he, uh, he admired Europe as a source of uh, modernity, you know, as, uh, as a much more developed uh, country than Russia was uh, at that time. Today, look, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, of course, still Europe is much more attractive uh, than Russia in terms of standard of living and then so on and so forth. But uh, economic changes, troubles uh, in the European Union and identity changes uh, in many European countries and in the West at large, you know, the expansion of this progressive, I will use the American term, progressive culture uh, and uh, ideology uh, attempts to revise your own history, by the way, talking about history, right? There is a process of revision of history uh, going on and historical identity uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in many Western societies. All this reduces the uh, attractiveness uh, of Europe uh, for, uh, for Russia. So uh, in terms of culture, again, yes, Russia is uh, uh, a part of European civilization and it is a European country by identity. In terms of political values, such as minority rights, you know, sexual minority rights and so on and so forth, uh, 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 there is a widening gap uh, uh, between Russia uh, and, uh, and Europe and Russia does not associate itself uh, with the uh, with the prevailing identity trends, political identity trends uh, in uh, in European countries, right? Uh, moreover, we can say that Russia positions itself as the real Europe, you know, as the as the classical Europe, contrary to the post uh, uh, classical post historic Europe uh, uh, in uh, in Western Europe uh, uh, and in the West. 
uh, in the West at large. Uh, the uh, uh, identity and civilizational elements in uh, uh, Russian policy towards Ukraine and Belarus is, of course, vital. Um, uh, you, you, you know, um, one of the reasons why Russia considers natural for Ukraine and Belarus to participate in Russia-centric uh, uh, orbit, in Russia-centric community, is of course civilizational and uh, identity issues. You know, uh, and Putin seems to sincerely believe uh, when he says that Ukrainians and Russians is one people. Right? And I think that there is a belief in the Russian society that, again, as soon as the Western policy change, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine will change as well, and this natural historic identity will prevail over the current uh, trends of uh, Ukrainian foreign policy and political development, which, uh, from the Russian perspective, are unnatural, right? which are alien. Uh, uh, alien uh, for the uh, for the majority of uh, uh, of Ukrainian society, right? Because the majority of Ukrainian society speak Russian, watch Russian and Soviet movies, you know, and uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, uh, so the, the the current trends are uh, 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 perceived alien, uh, and uh, in the longer term prospect, uh, the historical trends are. Uh, supposed to prevail. Whether this thinking is right or wrong, I don't know, right? Because uh, we still see a, 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 a construction of a new European uh, uh, anti-Russian uh, uh, identity in, uh, in Ukraine, right? This identity is based on opposition between Russia and Europe, Right uh, and uh, Ukrainian uh, kind of pro-European development is simultaneously anti-Russian uh, development. Whether this is uh, really deep and how deep uh, this uh, identity development uh, in Ukraine is, we don't know. Right, and I, I, I truly cannot give this uh, answer, and I think no one can give this answer. A, any answer to this question will be a result of preferences rather than the real uh, uh, objective, um, uh, uh, objective analysis. Uh, the same for Belarus, of course. Uh, but as for um, the general issue of civilization, in Russian foreign policy. Well, it, it, it matters when it comes to Ukraine uh, and Belarus, um, but uh, in, in, indeed, it, because, of this civiliz because of this civilizational uh, uh, issues, it is simply unacceptable for Russia to have uh, Ukraine as it is today. Simply unacceptable. And the situation, by the way, is uh, quite troublesome right now. You uh, you said at the very beginning that you don't want us to discuss the current events, right? But today there is uh, a new aggravation of the situation uh, uh, around Ukraine, right? And Russia makes it very clear that uh, the current trend of Ukrainian development, both internal and external, is completely unacceptable. And basically, the message that Russia wants now to send to the West and to the United States in particular, is that either the United States now persuade Ukraine to do something, right, and to change something, uh, or, you know, Russia will take unilateral action, military action, which, of course, Russia doesn't want to take objectively, but it will be compelled uh, to take it because uh, this uh, uh, development of Ukraine as anti-Russia uh, is absolutely uh, unacceptable. And the reason for this uh, absolute unacceptability is civilization, right? Is civilization uh, 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 much more so than with uh, with any other uh, country in the post-Soviet space? With Belarus, right? If last year there had been a regime change in Belarus, we would have had the same conflict, right? And I have no doubts Russia would have used military force. If Lukashenko had been toppled down, or uh, if he were at the brink of being toppled down, because preservation of Belarus in the Russian orbit is absolutely vital because of this civilizational element. Beyond that, you know, in the post-Soviet space in general, I would probably disagree uh, because I do not consider Russia and, for instance, Uzbekistan, uh, or Russia and Azerbaijan, or Russia and Tajikistan. 
uh, belonging to the same uh, to the same civilization. Here, foreign policy orientation uh, is the major determinant of Russian attitude uh, uh, to uh, to those countries. You know, uh, uh, Ilham Aliyev can call uh, uh, Erdogan his brother. You know, uh, as much as possible, as much as he like. He only, you know, needs to um, uh, to fulfill the prince the three principles that I listed above, and he will be fine with uh, uh, fine with that because we do not consider Azerbaijan as parts of the same civilization. Um, Dmitry, we've only got uh, ten minutes left, and we have fourteen questions, so uh, we can't, of course, go through more than just a few. Um, I, I, I just want to ask you three questions, I think, and then I'm sure. afraid we're going to have to conclude. Uh, one is my last question to you, which is about these asymmetries in uh, Sino-Russian relations, which I think may be coming a little more pronounced and a little more urgent than your timescale suggested. So whether it's the abandonment of nuclear minimalism by China, which must be a threat, I think, uh, to Russia, whether it's space, which is hotting up and Russia being displaced to it by China uh, in, in the very, very near future, if not already, uh, or whether it is Taiwan, the clock uh, ticking uh, for some kind of military confrontational resolution within the next seven or eight years, which will force Russia to have to make a choice uh, yeah. in this respect. So I think these are, are complicating factors. We have uh, two questions I, I just want to also add, one on the Arctic uh, from somebody from the Arctic Institute, talking about Russian military dominance in the Arctic. Is this now threatened with increased NATO involvement in the Barents Sea? I mean, Britain itself, uh, for example, is also part of that uh, intention of, of involving itself more militarily. And the other is about hybrid warfare, which you didn't mention, to which I might add frozen conflicts or frozen confrontations, which seem to be a Russian, I wouldn't say speciality, but seem to be part of Russian strategic thinking, a kind of Russian cultural style, even though I know that Putin would say that the West invented hybrid warfare and has been practicing it in its own way. But anyway, if we can just restrict it to those three questions, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to, to draw to an end at 7.30, leaving all the other excellent questions unanswered. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher. On, uh, on uh, China, uh, Taiwan conflict, yes, uh, this might be a game changer. Uh, because uh, uh, Taiwan, if Ch Taiwan conflict escalates, the U.S.-China confrontation will definitely uh, go to a fundamentally different level. Uh, it will be no longer low intensity conflict. Quite likely there will be a U.S.-China military clash, right? Otherwise, simply the U.S. will uh, face the collapse of its uh, systems of alliances in Asia. Uh, and China will establish its dominance uh, in Asia, which is unacceptable for the United States. So uh, that will could be a game changer, uh, uh, which indeed would aggravate the Russian global standing. Uh, and in con well, first Russia uh, tries to be neutral to the situation in the South China Sea and the Taiwan situation. Russia doesn't want to interfere uh, into that and, uh, and, uh, and tries to position itself as independent kind of observer, not a, a military ally of China. But if confrontation between China and the United States really escalates up to hot war, right, uh, then indeed, uh, Russia would probably have to make choice, uh, and uh, in the current situation, Russia will be compelled uh, to choose uh, uh, to, to, to choose China, uh, and you know it will be just uh, very sad uh, 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 development for uh, for Russia. So we have to hope uh, that um, uh, this uh, aggravation of tensions over Taiwan would not result result into the uh, open military clash. Um, uh, after all, China and the United States are nuclear countries where there is nuclear deterrence uh, between them, although it is not, uh, it is not excluded. You are, uh, you are absolutely right. Um, and this is a challenge uh, for Russia, which might be even quicker than uh, rather than uh, long term. China's uh, nuclear military development and uh, space development I would say these are political challenges uh, to Russia, political and psychological challenges to Russia, not mi military challenges. Yes, uh, Russia will cease to be the only um, uh, 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 the the only counter 
partner of the United States in nuclear arms control, in the area of nuclear weapons. Yes, Russia will lose its status as the second and only uh, uh, nuclear superpower and the only peer to the United States in the area of, uh, of uh, nuclear weapons. Well, but this is uh, uh, this seems to be unavoidable, by the way. This is, these are one of the things that we can and do uh, uh, calculate. But uh, it does not mean that Russia will marginalize. You know, there will be three nuclear superpowers instead of two nuclear superpowers. Yes, psychologically, as I said, psychologically, it will be uneasy for Russia. But we can't do anything uh, about that. But China becoming the third nuclear superpower does not automatically mean that China will start posing a military threat vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Why? I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, China will start posing military threat if Russia-China relations become adversarial, if Russia-China relations deteriorate, if China starts to conduct a hegemonic policy vis-a-vis uh, vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis Russia. This is not likely, as I said, in the observable future. If there is no escalation in, uh, over Taiwan, right? Uh, so, well, uh, uh, in this case, well, basically, we will have from the Russian perspective, or we will try to have a partnership with China as a nuclear superpower, right? And as long as political relations between Russia and China are friendly, uh, based on partnership, Russia does not consider China as the object of its nuclear deterrence uh, policy, right? And this is, uh, this is highlighted in all the major nuclear planning, by the way, uh, uh, documents that Russia uh, uh, that Russia has, right? And uh, 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 again, uh, the increase of China's military and nuclear power that does not automatically decrease Russia. Uh, nuclear and military power, Russia still maintains and will continue to maintain very, very robust uh, uh, nuclear arsenal, full-fledged triad, you know, and Russia will try even to, to, to keep the wedge. You know, so far Russia does have it in the in terms of hypersonic missiles, right, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So, I mean, it is not considered as a military threat. Political unpleasant development, yes, but look, I mean, we uh, we cannot keep our gap uh, over uh, over China. We don't have these uh, 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 these uh, uh, resources. Um, uh, 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 Arctic. Well, uh, from the Russian perspective, uh, there is a very uh, a substantial spillover of great power competition into the Arctic. Look, first you have to understand that Arctic is a strategic region for Russia uh, because of the because of geography, I mean, uh, Russia is a half of Arctic, right? Uh, uh, because uh, because of the role that Arctic plays uh, in Russian economic development, 20% uh, of Russian exports originate from the Arctic, right? Uh, and for, uh, for Russia, Arctic is not a, a remote region like Alaska for the United States or uh, Greenland. Uh, for Denmark, this is part of the country where people live, you know, and uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the the climate change, melting of the of the Arctic ice, accelerates the uh, uh, great power competition and the spillover of great power competition into the Arctic. Why? Because Arctic becomes accessible, because Arctic ends to be the natural buffer. Right, uh, it, it is becoming a sea, right? Not an ice, but a sea. And sea is not a buffer, sea is a, you know, as, as by the way, quite rightly, American uh, Arctic strategy, defense, uh, uh, the defense Department Arctic strategy claims, becomes a buffer for power projection, right? Uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an Arctic height among the Arctics and non Arctic countries. Right, uh, uh, so we have a, a, a combination uh, of this transformation of Arctic into the sea, uh, into the ocean, into the normal ocean, uh, and great power competition. So it kind of spills uh, in, uh, spills over into the into the Arctic, and this is very troublesome for uh, for Russia. This is why Russia is compelled. Uh, to uh, to militarize uh, the region in order to maintain its uh, its presence because from from the Russian perspective there will be increasing American China's 
you know, uh, and the others' presence in the Arctic, and Russia has to prevail. This is the region where Russia really has to prevail. So it is natural for Russia to be stronger militarily in the Arctic than the others. Right. Plus, uh, of course, Arctic is the place, is the region where Russian strategic nuclear submarines are uh, deployed. Right. So this is another element to the strategic importance of Russia uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, for Arctic. Right. Uh, at the same time, of course, Russia prefers to keep the Arctic as a region for cooperation rather than conflict. But it is uh, it, it, it is highly uh, improbable that we will be able uh, to do that. Uh, at best, we will compartmentalize. So today, Russia tries to compartmentalize great power competition on the Arctic in the Arctic on the one hand and continuation of the cooperative Arctic uh, policies. You know, environmental protection, indigenous people, you know, and so on and so forth uh, on the uh, uh, on the other hand. But you know, this uh, 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 Arctic is becoming a place of intensifying, intensifying great power competition and uh, arms race and uh, uh, militarization. Uh, uh, frozen conflicts. Well, uh, Dimitri, I'm going to yeah. have to stop you, sorry, um, because we've reached 7.30 exactly, and we have to end at 7.30, so I'm sorry we, we can't hear your thoughts on hybrid warfare and frozen conflicts. Um, and I apologize to uh, others who uh, haven't had the chance for the questions to be asked, but I'd like to thank you very much uh, for everything today and for speaking with a, a frankness, which uh, some Europeans definitely would find uh, a, a little disconcerting, perhaps, because we don't use uh, the frankness that uh, you've used. But I think it does show that uh, Russia has very, very strong strategic principles, which are not subject to uh, politicians identifying red lines here and there, um, but that those principles are enduring and, and of historical interest. So thank you very much again for your contribution today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.